morning and welcome to the third QML meetup. So today um, we have Robert with us. Before I go into the details of what we're going to talk about today, um, I'll give you a background or the history of the meetup again. So this sort of started under the umbrella of um, Quantum Open Source uh, Foundation. Um, there's a mentorship program in it. If you're curious or you want to learn under under some mentors about how to do quantum software development or how to or what kind of research topics are interesting right now in quantum machine learning, this is a really nice platform. So we sort of met there, and uh, a bunch of us um, uh, mentors decided to start this program because of a very you know overwhelming interest in this in this field right now. So uh, with me, I have Amira and Antal. Um, Antal could not join today, I think. Uh, I think he's busy, but Amira is with us and we both are really happy to have you guys. And uh, as usual, uh, thank you to Francesco for being there, for helping us organize this, and also Ilya and the University of Kavazulu Natal uh, for helping us set up this you know, platform and the meeting and Zoom and everything and the logistics for this. Um, so yeah, so maybe we wait, wait a couple of minutes before we start the talk. In the meantime, I can introduce uh, Robert to you. Robert is a young upcoming researcher <laughs> with a lot of uh, potential. He's a PhD student at uh, California Institute of Technology at Caltech with John Preskill. He's working in the field of machine learning and quantum information theory. And today he'll talk about his recent work on how using data changes the computational complexity of classical machine learning models. And this is a very interesting and very impactful work. So we're very happy to have you here, Robert. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, let's wait like a minute or so. How does that sound? And then we can start. In the meantime, you can uh, share your slides. OK. I thought you also wanted to introduce the next speaker. And I'll do at the end. So oh, okay. just do a shout out at the end. Yeah. Sounds good. You probably have to first stop sharing so that, okay. I think that works. So should I start now or? <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's go for it. I think, what are we? already three minutes maybe you can reintroduce yourself because <laughs> okay. i would argue that you're not upcoming and you're already a pretty pretty well established pretty good <laughs> pretty good uh -huh. researcher and doing very interesting work in quantum machine learning so yeah maybe you can say a word about yourself and then, and then yeah so ahead. my name is robert and i'm working at caltech at the moment um, i'm a phd student i just finished my third year and i mainly work on theoretical aspects of in the intersection of quantum information, quantum physics, and machine learning. So I'll be talking about um, this work, Power of Data in Quantum Machine Learning, which was uh, recently published at Nature Communication. This is a joint work with people from Google AI Quantum, with Michael Broughton, Masu Masani, Ryan Babush, Sergio Boixo, Harman Nevin, and Jeremy McLean. So recently, uh, people have a lot of interest in applying machine learning to solve very challenging problems in quantum chemistry and quantum physics, where people hope to utilize um, machine learning to provide solutions better than non-machine learning algorithms. And furthermore, people also wanted to, of course, utilize quantum machine learning that could yield even better solutions for these type of problems. However, despite a lot of interest, many fundamental questions remain to be answered. In particular, um, here are two of them. The first is, what is the computational power of classical machine learning algorithms trained on data? Are classical machine learning algorithms trained on data more powerful than non-machine learning algorithms? So that's uh, one of the key questions that we'll try to and provide answer uh, in this talk. And then given the first question, um, the second question is, of course, could quantum machine learning be more powerful than classical machine learning algorithms in solving different kind of uh, tasks. So to begin, we will first discuss what machine learning algorithms are. Essentially, they're just normal algorithms, but with the availability of training data. That is, in typical algorithm, like in the bottom left, you have a single tree machine that works for all different problem sizes and all different kind of inputs. But for machine learning algorithm, there is this 
addition of training data that could help with your computation. In a sense that in addition to the stream machine that um, would run for all these different problem size and different um, inputs, you also have this additional information of training data, um, which are in this talk, we will focus on the typical survey setting. That is, you would have a collection of examples of a form X mapping to Y. That is, the X is the input, like an image, and Y is the output, like whether that image is a train or a car or a dog or a, dog or a cat, etc. And what the classical machine learning algorithm could do is not only given, um, like, it's not just a tree machine, but it can be fed with this training data that allows it to utilize those training data to perform computation and to make prediction and so on. So once you compare this class, this classical machine learning algorithm class, to this other class called p slash pauli So p slash pauli is a, another very well studied computational complexity class where for each problem size, we assume that we will be given some advice string from some all powerful being. So this advice string is just a polynomial size bit string that could help you with your computation in the maximum possible way. So it's provided by some all powerful being that it's like the best advice you could get in order to help you with your computation. So it is well known that um, P slash Pauli is strictly more powerful than BPP in a sense that there are problems that could be solved using a classical algorithm with advice, but that cannot be solved efficiently using only classical algorithms. So on one hand, you can actually think of this training data as a restricted form of advice. So recall what I said, um, training data are just a polynomial size of examples telling you that for this input, this is the corresponding output. For that input, that is the corresponding output. So you can also think of it as a, uh, some kind of uh, advice, a polynomial bit string that try to help you with your computation. But it's a restricted form because it always follows this kind of um, setting where you have, where this training data is given as examples rather than some arbitrary bit string that could help you with your computation maximally. So now utilizing, um, basically you can formalize all of that um, with the language of tree machine, computational complexity, and now you can rigorously analyze what are the relationship between these different classes of algorithm. So for classical algorithm, that's the problems that could be solved by classical algorithm, that's known as BPP. So that's the, the circle in the middle. And then we also have been, I think people here also know about um, the class that could be solved using quantum computer. So that's known as BQP. So that's the bigger circle that contains BPP. On the other hand, we also have this um, P slash Pauli, which is classical algorithm with advice that can maximally help you. So that's this white class. So it is well known that there are problems inside P slash Pauli that's actually outside of BQP. So you can actually, basically the intuition is that when the advice string um, cannot be computed, cannot be generated, um, efficiently using quantum computer, then by utilizing that device string, you can solve problems that's um, harder and, than what you can solve with quantum computer. So P slash Pauli is this other class. And now we have this um, blue class, classical ML algorithm with training data. So that is the class that we're interested in. One could utilize similar technique to show that there are problems that you can solve using classical ML algorithm with some powerful data that you cannot solve with classical algorithm alone or with uh, quantum algorithm. More, um, more precisely, there are actually undecidable problems that are problems that cannot be solved by any Turing machine, um, but you can solve it with, um, with classical algorithm with training data or classical algorithm with advisory. So I saw, I think there are some questions, uh, but I would actually postpone uh, the answer, uh, answering the question to the end of the talk. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, but please feel free to post questions and I'll answer them at the end. So what this theoretical analysis shows is that classical algorithms that could obtain and learn from data can actually be computationally more powerful than classical algorithm 
alone. And the power actually comes from data. So there's nothing really special about neural networks or things like that. It's really this data that provides the additional computational power that enables one to solve challenging problems. So up until this point, it's pretty formal and there's not much um, examples provided. So what I would do right now is to provide a more physical or chemi chemistry example for showing that how the availability of training data could really change the complexity. So what we are going to consider here is that we have some initial state. It's a single particle unsigned fermionic state. So maybe you don't know what that jargon means, but let's assume that you have n equal to three, then a single particle unsigned fermionic state can always be written as the superposition over one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, one where alpha, beta, gamma, they're just like some complex um, amplitude. So now that's our initial state. Let's say that's our initial state. And we evolve it under some general interacting time-dependent Hamiltonian evolution or some polynomial time. Now, after the evolution, um, in general, the resulting outcome would just be a superposition over all possible states. So instead of a, a superposition over these Three particular states, it's a superposition over two to the n different um, state. And since this u is just a general polynomial time unitary transformation, if you wanted to predict property of this output state, let's say you wanted to estimate the expectation value of some observable O on this output state u psi unique, it's expected to be hard classical. And one could show that if you can actually solve this, uh, like if you can actually predict it properly um, efficiently with some arbitrary, uh, with, with a classical algorithm without training data, with just normal classical algorithm, you can show that every quantum circuit could be simulated by classical computer, which we don't believe it's true. But now the situation changes drastically when we are given training data. So one could show that when you're given roughly unsquared training data, so not so this n here is the system size where the quantum Hilbert space would be two to the n dimensional. So you don't need two to the n training data. You only need a polynomial, unsquared training data. After you get this unsquared training data, you can actually predict property of new initial state using classical computer very easily. The reason is that um, if you write out the input output uh, relation, so your input is this n dimensional vector representing the initial state of psi unit. The output property is actually a quadratic function. And this quadratic function is only over this n-dimensional vector instead of two to the n-dimensional vector. So all you have to do is to learn this quadratic function, which can be done. And you can learn that using only roughly unsquared training data. And after learning, you can make prediction about what the outcome for a new input would be. So this example shows that when you have training data, problem could become much, much easier when you don't have training data. The reason is because the training data essentially gives you sort of the key answer, like the core of the hardness in the original problem. And by just taking those training data, um, all you have to do is to generalize from the training data instead of computing everything from scratch. So that allows one to obtain more computational power, and that allows one to solve problems that are originally hard. So what are some implications of this fact, which we call the power of data? There are, in particular, two of them, which we will briefly uh, The first one we will discuss in more detail, and the second one we are only briefly mention it. The first is that, as one can see, um, when you have training data and you utilize a machine learning algorithm, it becomes a bigger class. So you can solve more problems. Some problems, like for example, this one, originally you need a quantum computer to solve, but after getting this unsquared training data, you only need a classical computer to make prediction for new inputs. So that will rival some existing quantum machine learning model, um, even for learning some 
quantum problems, even for solving some quantum problems that are hard to simulate classically. And the second implication, which is more on the positive side, is that what this result shows is that you can obtain data from doing experiments from nature, and now you can utilize this data to train classical machine learning algorithm to solve some very challenging quantum many-body problems. So first, uh, the first part of the talk, um, I will focus on the first implication, that is the fact that this realization allows us to see that classical ML algorithm could be potentially more powerful than what we originally expected. And it could diminish quantum advantage in a machine learning tasks. So under this realization, we would like to understand, given this, when could we still have advantage in a machine learning task? What are some conditions that's required for us to see an advantage. Here we, are, here we are mainly focused on classical and quantum kernel machine learning models. So in order to motivate this, here's a useful proposition that's proved in our paper. We showed that training a quantum kernel model is equivalent to training an arbitrarily deep quantum neural network that meshes any observable at the end. So from an expressibility point of view, quantum kernel model is more expressive than any quantum neural network. But expressibility is not um, the only thing we care about. We actually care about generalization. Um, and typically, when you have a model that's very expressive, its generalization performance are typically not so great. But, but yeah, but nonetheless, we are still going to focus on kernel ML models. And more precisely, what we're going to consider is the following set of problem. We will have some initial state, uh, we wish has some initial vector x side. We will encode it using some encoding circuit into the quantum state space. And then we will consider um, the output yi to be a function of the original xi in the following form. We would have, we would first evolve the encoded quantum state by some quantum circuit, which we represent as uq and n. And at the end, we will measure some observable. Um, the expectation value of some observable would be the output. So the data will just be xi mapping to yi. And the goal is given a new input x, predict y equal to f of x. So essentially simulating a quantum circuit. So this is a very general model um, because all quantum computation can be casted into this form. And what we're going to focus on so now we have this learning task. We have some training data. And the goal is to learn from the training data such that given a new input, you can predict what is the output of the quantum circuit. And we are going to focus on kernel machine learning model as the machine learning model for making prediction. And here, I'm going to present a, one sort of like a representative of this class of kernel machine learning model. This representative, I think, should be familiar for many people. It's basically a classical neural network with a large hidden layer. So suppose you're given this training data, xi, mapping to yi. And recall that before, this yi is just a expectation value of the observable O after evolving through some unitary U. What we're going to do is we're going to train a classical neural network with large hidden layer to minimize the training error. Using recent re uh, development in classical learning theory, one could show that the trained neural network is equivalent to this following analytical form. So you, interestingly, you can actually write down the resulting um, trained neural network with an analytical formula, and it depends on this k, which is called the kernel function. The kernel function can be seen, at, um, it's formally defined as the following. So you have x and x prime. What you do is you map this x and x prime into a high dimensional Hilbert space, and then you take inner product in the high dimensional uh, Hilbert space. So that's the definition of kernel function. And then this uh, capital K is just the kernel matrix. That is, the ij entry of this matrix will be the kernel function for xi and xj. So we call that xi is the i's training data, and xj is the j's training data. So yeah, so this is uh, uh, one of the um, 
more famous example of a kernel ML model, a more modern example of a kernel ML model, but also there are more traditional ML models such as Gaussian kernel SVMs that are also, that can also be written as the same form. There are also kernel ML models, as well as quantum kernel methods that um, Maria Xu and people from IBM have, uh, have, uh, have many studied on. So they are also part of this class of machine learning model based on kernel function. So now in this paper, what we prove is the following. We showed that the prediction error after training a kernel ML model can be upper bounded by this quantity here. So what this formula is in the left-hand side is just the expectation value over a new input X. What is the error? What is the difference between the function learned by the kernel ML model and the true function f of x. We proved that it would be less than or equal to roughly an order of square root sk over n. So this capital N is the training data size, and this sk is given in the, uh, in, the, in the bottom line. It's just some formula that depends on both the kernel that you utilize and the function, the true function you're trying to learn. So as you can see, um, the more training data, the better the prediction. And Furthermore, if you found that this SK quantity is small, that is, it's much smaller than the training data size, then this prediction error bound, this rigorous prediction error bound, tells us that the kernel model will be able to accurately predict this f of x, irrespective of whether f of x is hard to compute without the training data. So recall from the previous example on this fermionic evolution, what one typically, uh, what one could show is that this SK quantity um, will be roughly in the order of, can be upper bounded by n squared. So that's why you only need a training data of n squared to make accurate prediction. So as you can see now, if you found that for some quantum problems, um, this SK quantity is small when you utilize some classical um, machine learning model, like a classical neural network, then you know that the classical neural network will be able to predict the answer for the quantum problem very easily. So in order for a quantum advantage to happen, what we want is that this SK quantity must be large for all classical, like efficient classical machine learning model. But that's also not enough because maybe the problem is too hard. So even quantum machine learning model doesn't work. So what we need is actually the following. We need S quantity to be large for a classical ML model, and this S quantity to be small for some quantum machine learning model. So what this S quantity, um, so yeah, so now we're going to dive a little bit more into discussing what is this S quantity really means. So essentially, it's a, it's a measure of similarity uh, or like how matched up is the machine learning model and the true function you're trying to learn. So mathematically, it's just given by this form. And as you can see, it depends on the kernel function and as well as the true function f you're trying to learn. And one way to view this is that for a given kernel k, you can think of it as defining some kind of a geometry for the space of function. So after fixing a particular k, sk is actually a function that takes in, it's a meta function that takes in a function that you're trying to learn and output a single value. And if that value is small, that means you're, you will be able to predict it accurately. And if that value is large, you're not going to be able to predict accurately. So another way to think of it is that sk is providing a rigorous quantif uh, quantification for inductive bias. So basically when you pick an ML model, there will be certain functions that it's easier to learn and there will be certain functions that it's harder to learn. And that's exactly what SK is quantifying. So for example, if you have two different ML model corresponding to two different kernel, they induces two different S quantity. And this, or you can say S meta function or something. And this S meta function will 
generate this kind of different geometry for different quantum circuit you're trying to learn. So for example, um, the quantum model two, um, it's easy and both ML, uh, ML model one and ML model two can learn them efficiently. But quantum model three um, have a much larger S value for ML model one. So ML model one will not be able to predict quantum model three efficiently, but ML model two will be able to predict quantum model three efficiently. So once you think of this S quantity as a rigorous characterization for the inductive bias for each machine learning model. So if you pick quantum kernel method, it would induce a S quantity that's different from if you use a classical neural network. And, and yeah, and different S quantity means there are different functions that could be learned using the two different ML models. So now an important quantity um, that we define and we study in this work is called geometric difference. Basically, if you consider this, um, if you define the, uh, another function between two different kernel, G, as following, then you can show that the S quantity for, let's say, some classical kernel as C will be less than or equal to G squared times SQ for some quantum kernel. And what this means is that if you found this G to be small, it means SC will be less than or equal to some small value times SQ, meaning that whenever this S quantity for, some, for the quantum ML model is small, the S quantity for the classical ML model would also be small. And what that logical, in that, uh, what that logical statement means is that there's just no function F that exists where this particular quantum ML model could outperform classical ML model. On the other hand, if you found this G, geometric difference G to be quite large, one could show that there's always exists a function such that the quantum ML model could outperform classical ML model. So it's quite important. So basically, this uh, every time you created some quantum machine learning algorithm, what you wanted to check is whether this geometric difference is sufficiently large. Particularly, this geometric difference measures the difference between um, how quantum ML and classical ML model sees the relationship between the data. If they see the relationship in a similar fashion, then there's not going to be much quantum advantage. But if they see the data in a very different way, then there is a potential for a very large quantum advantage. So using this rigor theory, we develop this flow chart for understanding when there's a quantum advantage in a machine learning task. Basically, you first conduct the geometric test to see if the geometric dif difference is small or large. If it's small, you know that the classical ML model will predict similarly or even better than quantum ML. And if you found that the geometric difference is large, then you know that there are some data sets such that there is a large quantum advantage. But if you have a particular data set or a particular function or problem that you try to solve, you still have to go through and see if the S quantity is small. Like if S quantity is small for a classical ML model, then the classical ML model can learn and predict well. But if you found that the S quantity for a classical ML model is large, and the S quantity for a quantum ML model is small, this part, then you're in good shape. You have a potential quantum advantage. So now after, yeah, so after, after the development of these rigorous prediction error bound, we can also study what kind of limitation does quantum kernel model, uh, quantum kernel methods has. The key problems in quantum kernel methods is that when you consider this encoding into the quantum Hilbert space, where you utilize this exponentially large quantum Hilbert space, it's often the case that um, they will be too far apart. And when they're too far apart, this kernel associated kernel matrix KQ, it will be close to identity. And when it's close to identity, that's not a good sign. The reason is because if you look at the definition of geometric difference, if you plug in KQ equal to identity, and then you pick KC to be identity, you can see that the geometric difference is roughly equal to one which is not a very large number. And that means SC will be less than or equal to SQ, meaning that um, the classical ML model can compete or even outperform quantum kernel methods in learning any quantum models. And furthermore, one could also rigorously show that for some simple quantum models, 
quantum kernel methods actually require exponential number of data to learn well, but classical ML only require linear number of data. So in order to circumvent this um, limitation and drawbacks, um, here's one solution that we proposed in the paper. There's potentially more, but this is just one solution. The main problem here is that while people utilize quantum Hilbert space, like in quantum kernel methods, people embed this classical um, object, classical vectors into this exponentially large quantum Hilbert space in the hope that when you have this exponentially large quantum Hilbert space, you get exponential quantum advantage. But there's also this sort of a uh, um, repulsive force saying that if everything is too far apart, then you're not going to get quantum advantage. So what we do, um, what we propose is that after you map into the exponentially large quantum Hilbert space, you project it back to some classical space using some reduced observable or maybe classical shadow. And then we define a kernel in the classical space. So while one might think, wait, but isn't that you start from a classical space, you go to this quantum Hilbert space, but you project it back, then wouldn't all the quantum advantage be lost? Actually, it, it wouldn't, because in order to compute this projected quantum kernel, you still require a quantum computer. And actually, in practice, we found that by doing this projection, it results in a much higher geometric difference. And furthermore, you can easily prove various kinds of quantum advantage using this projected quantum kernel. For example, you can show that it's very easy to achieve, like to learn this problem, this learning problem based on discrete logarithm using this projected quantum kernel. The proof is only like one page. On the other hand, if you wanted to show that the quantum kernel method could learn to um, could learn the above problem, it is much, much more complicated. And, and this paper uh, by Srinivasan and, and Yunxiao spent um, many, many pages in order to show that quantum kernel actually works in that regime. Well, if you just use this projection, um, it's just a one page proof, which is very straightforward. So now let's look at some experiments. So here we're going to focus on fashion MNIST because um, it's a, basically it's a much harder, uh, it's a much harder alternative um, for, uh, for MNIST in, in this data set, what we're going to focus on is a binary classification. That is, we will be given a bunch of images and we are going to classify between whether it's a dress or if it's a shirt. What we're going to do is we will map each image to an n-dimensional vector by performing PCA. And we will consider three different embedding strategy for embedding classical vector into quantum Hilbert space. The first one is the separable rotation circuit. That is, you take each of these input and for each of the qubit, you just rotate it. The second one is an IQP circuit that was proposed by this by IBM people. And the third one is the Hamiltonian evolution circuit. That is, we utilize this n-dimensional vector to define a Hamiltonian and we evolve it to encode um, the vector into a quantum Hilbert space. We also consider another data set which is sort of a, like a stilted data set for quantum um, ML models. That is, we consider this data set that's generated by quantum process. What we're going to do is, instead of the original label for distinguishing between if it's a dress or if it's a shirt, um, what we're going to do is we're going to replace that original label by some output from the hard to simulate Hamiltonian evolution. Particularly what we're going to consider is the two-dimensional Heisenberg evolution. And after the evolution, we will measure some local Z operator. And that will be the output um, that the machine learning model has to predict. And we're going to consider, we, we consider a wide list of different classical ML model from random forest to gradient boosting to neural networks to kernel methods. And all of them, we will properly tune the hyperparameter and report the best model. So here's the numerical, um, here's the plot from the numerical experiment. In figure A, what we consider is different system size for the x-axis, and the y-axis is the geometric difference. So as you can see, um, as system size grows, the Hilbert space will also grow exponentially. And what we found is that the, quant the geometric difference 
between quantum kernel method and some classical ML model actually decreases as your system size grows, meaning that the quantum advantage would just keep shrinking as the system size increases, which is not what we typically want and also expect. Um, on the other hand, we from figure A, you can see that by doing this projection back to the classical space, this projected quantum kernel method, it actually have a much higher geometric difference for all embedding. So the purple one should be compared with the blue one, and this uh, and this uh, this light blue one should be compared with this orange one, and finally this pink one should be compared with this red one. And you can see that uh, because because they're using the same embedding, but just whether you project it at the end or not. And you can see that for each of this corresponding um, comparison, um, we see that by doing the projection, it helps increase the geometric difference quite significantly. And this effect is also can be seen this is the, uh, in, the, in the actual prediction error. So in figure B, um, we consider the x-axis for different system size and the y-axis is the prediction error on the test set. <laughs> we consider this four different data set. Um, data set C is the original classical data set. And the other three data set Q is the quantum data set um, based on this uh, random 2D Heisenberg evolution. So the green one is the best classical ML while all the other lines are other quantum machine learning models. So you can see that for small system size, um, if you use quantum kernel method, it, there are some improvement, there are some advantage um, for small system size. And this is also evident since the geometric difference for small, for small system size is quite high, especially for the red one and the orange one. So that's why you can see correspondingly there are advantage in the prediction error. However, when you go to larger system size from figure A, you can see that the geometric difference is quite small. And what that tells us is that there's no quantum advantage from our previous rigorous um, bound. And you can see the same thing. So here you see that um, um, classical ML actually predicts better than quantum kernel method. On the other hand, if you use projected quantum kernel method, you can see that there are some small advantage um, over different system sizes. And furthermore, the bigger the geometric difference is, the bigger the advantage seems to be. And, and yes, and for this experiment, what we're going to do is recall that when the geometric difference is large, we've proved that there always exists certain data set where there would be large advantage. And this is what we're going to show here. So what we do here is we utilize some learning theoretic technique to figure out what that data set should be that yields the biggest advantage between some classical ML models and some quantum ML models. So in figure A, we consider a setting where the geometric difference for the quantum ML model is small. And in, in this PQK E3, we have a setting where the geometric difference is large. So here, the y-axis is prediction accuracy. So it's not, so the higher, the better. And the y-axis are different system size. And you can see that um, indeed for when the geometric difference is small, the difference between um, this projected quantum kernel and the best classical ML is small. But when the geometric difference is large on this engineer data set, you can see a very large advantage in prediction accuracy. So yeah, so as you can see, um, the situation between small system size and large system size can actually differ greatly, in particular in this part. You see that for small system size, there's advantage, but for large system size, something completely different happens. There's some kind of a phase transition so that um, no, there's no longer an advantage in prediction accuracy. So in order to make things, so yeah, so in order to get a good understanding of the machine learning model, one has to make sure that things really scale to large system size so that, um, yeah, so that uh, the classical computer could not just simulate, keep simulate the quantum machine learning algorithm um, on its own. And in order to do that, um, we utilize this TensorFlow quantum um, where Michael Broughton have basically written up everything, 
he utilizes Google Cloud Platform to implement all of these. Um, and yeah, just a, just, a, just a credit and kudos to Michael Broughton for making all of these happen. So now um, at the second part, at the final part of this talk, I'll briefly talk about the second implication. So the first implication is that um, it could rival, like classical ML model could rival, as we have seen in these examples, could rival quantum ML models for predicting, um, um, for learning quantum problems. But we also showed that there are indeed some quantum advantage um, since it's also expected because there are some problems inside BQP that is outside of this blue class. But here we're going to briefly discuss the second implication that is utilizing computational power of data. Can we train classical ML to solve some very challenging quantum many body problem? And the short answer is yes. And some detail can be found in this paper linked below. So in particular, um, in this paper, we consider two different applications. The first is predicting ground state, which is one of the key applications for utilizing quantum computer. Like people wanted to utilize quantum computer, especially in particular VQE to find ground state. But could we actually do that with classical ML? So in this paper, we proved the following theorem showing that in a wide range of cases, you can actually just train a classical ML model to predict the ground state. In particular, we showed that for any smooth class of local Hamiltonians in some finite spatial dimension with a constant spectral gap, a classical ML algorithm can learn to predict the classical representation of the ground state that can be used to approximate all of these few body reduced density matrices up to a constant error using a training data and computational time that is both polynomial and system size. One thing to note is that um, the same task is known to be MP hard. So it's really important that you utilize classical machine learning algorithm training with data to solve this problem. You cannot just have a classical algorithm that doesn't um, learn from training data to solve the same problem. If you can do that, then P would be equal to MP, which is highly unlikely. And the proof of the theorem relies on several technical things, including classical shadow formalism, quasi adiabatic evolution, and generalization error bounds of kernel methods that we briefly discussed um, in the first part of the talk. And here is just another numerical experiment showing that you can predict the ground state of a two-dimensional systems using machine learning models. And the second application um, that we consider in this paper is predicting phases of matter. That is given some quantum state, predict which phase is in. Is it in a symmetry broken phase? And is it in a topological phase? Is it in a trivial phase? So this is also another application where people have to have been thinking, like for example, using quantum convolutional neural network to do. Um, what we show in this paper is that actually, if you just use classical machine learning model trained with data from physical experiments, it could also be very, very powerful. But in particular, we proved that if there exists some nonlinear function of few body reduced density matrices that can be used to classify these quantum phases of matter, then the classical algorithm can learn to classify them accurately using an amount of training data and computational time that both scale polynomially in system size. Some examples include symmetry broken phase, SPT phase, and various topological phases um, with finite correlation. And again, um, in this paper, we provide, uh, we also consider various numerical experiments. So this one is training an unsurvised classical machine learning model to classify between uh, SPT phase and symmetry broken phase and trivial phase. And basically you can see that without providing any, um, yeah, with, with, with only, you just give him all, a bunch of these states and then it could just on its own figure out what kind of phases are there. So for example, in the line of Delta equal to 0 0.5, there are two phases in the unsurvised machine learning model just found that on its own. And then when for Delta equal to 3.0, there are three phases and the unsurvised machine learning model could also figure that out on its own. So to conclude, um, in this part of data paper, we showed that data provide computational power that enables classical ML algorithms to become stronger than one would originally expect. 
and it potentially challenged quantum advantage in machine learning problems. However, we do believe that quantum advantage and prediction accuracy is still very possible, um, as we have shown in this numerical experiment. There are large advantage when the geometric difference is large. Um, however, uh, more investigation are still needed to fully claim the quantum advantage. And finally, um, another implication more on the positive side is that when you train a classical ML model with data coming from quantum experiments, it could potentially be a very powerful method to solve challenging quantum many body problems that could be useful before we have a very fast fault tolerant quantum computer. So that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. Wow, that was a really, really good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we can move to questions. Um, and I also, Antel is here now. So hi, Antel. I don't see you, but hi. Turn on your camera. Um, maybe I go with the first question. Um, so somebody, some people are confused about the SK function. Uh, they want to uh, see if there's some intuitive explanation for that. I think you explained it sort of captures the model complexity, but if you could like elaborate on that. Ah, I see. <clears throat> yeah, so basically, um, okay. So yeah, there's a question about what is the intuition of this SK quantity? So. Um, from a mathematical point of view, um, this SK quantity is capturing the complexity of GK. Basically, if think of it as like, it, there are some functions that are simpler and there are some functions that are more complicated. And if it's simpler, then SK quantity would be smaller. If it's more complicated, then this SK quantity would be larger. So that's the short, like sort of like from a mathematical point of view, that's, um, that's more of that, like the rigorous definition of SK. And from a more intuitive point of view, what this function is capturing is the sort of like the how, how matching is the kernel function and the true function that you wanted to learn. So basically you should think of kernel functions as defining a similarity measure. Like when, when two inputs XI and XJ, if they're close, then the kernel function will be higher and if they're farther apart, then the kernel function would be lower. But this closest and farther apart, that's sort of up to perspective. So for example, if you use convolution neural network, it induces a kernel that focuses on local features. But if you use this a feedforward neural network that induces a completely different kernel that focuses on different feature. So the definition of distance and the definition of kernel will change depending on what kind of machine learning model you use. And what does SK thing is computing is how does sort of this kernel function defined by the machine learning model match up with the true function. That is, um, if two things are considered close, will their function on that two point be very different. And basically the SK quantity would be small if they match up well. That is, if two things are considered close with using the kernel function, then the true function will also be similar. Then if that's the, if that's the case, then SK quantity would be small. On the other hand, if you consider two things to be close, but their true function is actually very far apart, then this SK quantity would be much larger. So that's the intuition for SK quantity. And I also saw there's another question about SK must be small and large compared to what? So that's a very good question. Um, it must be small and large compared to the training data size. So from this prediction error bound, you can see that if SK, like if your training data size is small and the SK quantity is similar to your training data size, then your prediction error is like some constant. It could be a, yeah. So basically you want the SK quantity to be small compared to the training data size. So training data size is like the, the measure for defining um, the, whether you regard it as small or large. I hope that's a answer Thank to the you. question. Yeah, I think so. I hope people are not like thinking about SC and SQ as something different. It's just the SK for classical and quantum models, right? So yes, yes, yes. Yeah, when I wrote SC and SQ, yeah, that's uh, yeah, yes, that's exactly okay. the case. Okay, I want to take the next question. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, sure. 
so yeah thanks Robert for the really really awesome talk I mean I'm I'm just sitting in awe <laughs> because I enjoyed it so much um and so a lot of questions in the beginning came around um complexity theory and I think lot, like general stuff that maybe in the interest of time we can just um send them over to you if you if you'd like to address them but uh, one question that I thought that was interesting comes from Evan, and I think it's also along the same lines of some other questions where people are asking about, like, how do we find this quantum advantage, right? So Evan says, could you give more details on how you constructed the data set with this large geometric difference? And did you find any features of this data set that one would intuitively expect to lead to a large geometric difference? And just ah. to maybe add, add to that quickly, like Amir asks, um, do you have any ideas about where this gap between KQ and KC might be found in large real data sets? So I think these questions kind of relate, right? Yes. So, so first, uh, this large geometric difference is actually not with respect to data set, it's with respect to the machine learning model. So like uh, you have large geometric difference between one machine learning model and the other, and data set is like a third thing that's independent of the two. So the first is how do you find a machine learning model that have large geometric difference, like a quantum machine learning model that has a large geometric difference with classical. So basically, you should think of it as um, the, the, the quantum machine learning model has to be quite special in the sense that it when, when, when the classical machine learning model thinks two things are close, the quantum machine learning model has to think that they are far. And when, the, when two things are deemed far by a classical machine learning model, the quantum machine learning model has to think they're close. So that's sort of the, the, the intuition for when there will be large geometric difference. So, so yeah, so, so, so that's, that's one. So that's sort of the criteria for having large geometric difference. And the second one is um, how do you construct a data set? Yeah, so, so constructing data set is, um, so basically here we constructed the data set and that was based on some kind of generalized eigenvector problem. So, so basically you can see that um, SK and SC follows this type of, uh, has this type of quadratic form. So you can actually try to find this F to be the one that has a constant, like one, like it's equal to one for SQ, but it's as large as possible for SC. So if you view it from this way, essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a, a function that let's say it lies on the on this ellipse but has the largest value on the other side which will correspond to this point i think like for example this point will have a much larger value for ml model 2 and finding that could be done using some like singular value transformation and stuff so that's more contrived um, that's that's a pretty contrived way of constructing the data set but you can always do that and now the another important feature is how do you like what kind of data set are there such that you will have this um, advantage? So basically, the first thing you want to do is you want the quantum machine learning model to think very differently from a classical machine learning model. Like I said, when the classical model thinks things aren't close, it just thinks things are far. And and then you have to find a data set such that this geometry defined by the quantum machine learning model is indeed also match up with the geometry for, um, for, the, for the data set you're trying to apply it to. So that's sort of the criteria that's required in order to find an advantage. So that's very related to the, the notion of inductive bias. So inductive bias is essentially what I just talked about. What the inductive bias in a machine learning model is what does the machine learning model thinks like who are close, who are far, and that induces this inductive bias. And you wanted to find some data set that match up with the inductive bias of your quantum machine learning algorithm in order to get advantage. Awesome, thank you. And then maybe I can selfishly ask <laughs> something about your opinion here. So because you mentioned quantum, like this inductive uh, bias stuff, which, oh, sorry, my connection is bad. Do you still hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I could pick um, up. Okay, okay, good. Um, so yeah, so this inductive bias stuff, I mean, um, what baffles my mind is like, why can we, why can we so easily find like 
kernels classically that work very well on general data sets, right? So like this Gaussian kernel and stuff like that. Do you, yeah. I mean, is, is there hope that we can have something like this on the quantum side? I mean. Yeah, but actually um, I think it's, it's the, the reason is the following is that when, like, when you have this vector and when the vectors are close, typically the functions are close. So it's just like a very natural thing, like in practice, when you just have two vectors, like when you represent the input as this vector, if two vector, they are close, then the corresponding true function are typically also close. Like, like the input vector often describe features of the things you wanted to see. And when you see that the two feature vector looks similar, you immediately expect that their, the, the function value should be similar. Like their classification outcome should be similar. And that's pretty much what Gaussian kernel is doing, right? Like Gaussian kernel is just taking the difference between two vector at this exponential thing. And, and yeah, and that works um, really well because of, I think the, of the underlying fact that for a lot of general learning problem, when the two vector are close, then yeah, like when the two vector are close under like L2 norm, then it's, uh, it's typically um, the target function is also going to be close. Um, so yeah, so, so I think it's a yeah, it's sort of an underlying nature um, when, of how you design the input, actually. Like oftentimes people would also do a bit of feature engineering to pick the right feature. And those features are typically chosen so that um, when the feature, like one of the entry in the feature vector is close, like when they're close, then the, the corresponding outcome should also be related in a, in a very simple and natural way. So I think that's a sort of one reason why this Gaussian kernel and works so well in practice. Um, but yeah, at least that's my intuition. I hope that's okay. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'm gonna uh, hand over to Antal to ask a question, and then Arusa, I guess you can conclude with uh, announcing the next speaker and stuff after. Yeah. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Robert. I I jumped in uh, midway, but um, really, really amazed. It's it's a, it was a really nice um, second half that I caught. Um, one question I saw, which I'm also curious about is how, how potentially your simulations might have been affected by um, noise from the from a quantum from the quantum computer. So um, the the plots that you you showed were they uh, theoretical in nature or were they uh, kind of sampled from a from a simulator or from from a, a real quantum device? Ah, so um, are you asked? Uh... I'm not entirely sure if he's asking about, or, or he or she is asking about this plot or, um, or some of these plots. So, so typically when there's noise, it becomes easier for a classical ML to learn. I think that's just a typical thing that people expect because when there's noise, things concentrate and, and so on. So it becomes a much simpler function to learn when there are noise in your physical system. Um, and then of course, that means the quantum advantage might shrink when there are noise. So in particular for this experiment, we indeed consider the case when the projected quantum kernel utilizes a perfect quantum computer without any noise. But actually there's a follow-up paper, I think from, from, um, from some group in, in, in Australia, from Sydney, I think, um, where they consider similar approach, um, like essentially this approach, and they consider the case when there is like noise everywhere in your circuit, and they showed that even under noise, you can still have this like advantage when you construct this engineered data set um, with uh, that saturate this large geometric difference. So. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm assuming maybe as we are running out of time, perhaps I was, I would like to continue, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you again, Robert. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, thank you. I'll just share my going out slides and we can, so we can announce the next speaker. There's still, still a lot of questions. Um, we encourage people to have uh, a go. Arisa, Arisa, we still see the, can you um, guys 
how do you say the presenter version <laughs> like we don't see the full slide i think we see like um oh okay but that's i mean it's good enough for our purposes if <laughs> we just want to introduce oh, the next piece. okay is it working now or no to okay um, we see it yeah <laughs> okay, maybe I just have this. Don't need to play. Okay, yeah, so uh, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Robert, for the wonderful talk. There, there are a lot of questions regarding complexity and uh, the experiments. Um, yeah, I, I would suggest that people have a look at the paper and go through maybe the talk again. Uh, thank you so much for the people who are answering in the chat. Uh, it's really nice to see some some really nice discussion going on. Uh, so yeah, we'll meet again in two months. So next time, we're very lucky to have Marco with us from Los Alamos National Laboratory. He, their group has a lot of really, really nice work on um, training parametrized quantum circuits, barren plateaus, and corresponding problems that, that come with that. So a lot of really nice uh, work that he'll hopefully um, you know summarize for us so we'll have him next time so yeah tune in next time that this would be in october in two months and uh, yeah thank you so much everybody for joining uh, and robert for the wonderful talk so yeah see you guys next time awesome bye thank you everyone bye-bye thank you, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.